Let's invite the Lord in. Let's welcome him. Let's thank him for his presence here. And then let's just um, get excited for God. So, dear Father in heaven, forgive us of our sins, Father. Thank you, Father, for being here. And forgive us, Lord God, of those sins that we commit on a daily basis, Father God, that we may approach your throne of grace with a righteous mind and a righteous heart. And again, we just thank you for your presence here today, Father God. Speak to us clearly. Speak to us loudly, Father. Open our ears, open our hearts that we may hear you, Lord, that we may want to know you. Those things that you put into us, Father, that we need to change, Father God in heaven, through your power, through the Holy Spirit, help us change these things to separate ourselves from the world, Father God in heaven, to be able to have a chasm between the world and us, Lord God in heaven, so we may be on that righteous path to the kingdom of heaven. Lord God in heaven, we just love you with all our hearts, minds, and soul, strength, Father God in heaven, and we just want to give you all glory, give you all praise for the work that you're doing in our lives, Lord God in heaven, and for the work that you'll do through our lives. Father, I just want to ask you that you would lift us, you would protect us, you would provide for us, Lord God in heaven, and you would guide us for the rest of our days. Change those things, Father, that are no good in our lives, Lord God in heaven. Remove them. Because at times, Father, we don't have the strength to do it on our own. So we lean on you, Father. We depend on you. And we ask you humbly to come and just protect us and be with us for the rest of our lives. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So as I mentioned, we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 10. And it's a very good chapter to talk, to start, because the author takes us through the crucifixion of Jesus and, and why he died and what that importance is. And we already know this to some degree. You know, if you've been studying the Bible, if you've been attending church, if you've been a Christian for a long, long time, you understand the importance of the crucifixion, the resurrection, and Jesus sitting at the right hand of God. You understand what that means for us, not only in this life, but in our eternal life with the King. So, you know, this is going to be a very, very uh, pleasant, joyful journey into chapter 10 and through chapter 10. So uh, let's get going. There's a lot to cover uh, through this whole chapter, but today we're going to cover verses 1 through 4, Hebrews chapter 10. So let me, um, let me start with this. Are you someone who believes Jesus lived, but not as the Bible describes? Are you someone that knows of Jesus, read about Jesus, but don't really believe that Jesus was able to perform all the miracles, change hearts and minds, change lives? Do you believe that he is truly the Son of God? Do you believe that only one man could change a whole world? Or do you think it takes a village? You know, a lot of people who are non-believers want you to believe that one man cannot make the changes necessary. But we know through our Lord Jesus Christ, he did and he does. And he continues to do it to this day. And he'll continue to do it until his return, the second coming of Christ. You know that to get to heaven, you must separate yourself from the world. And a lot of you ask, well, what do you mean separate myself from the world? I live in the world. I have to be a part of the world. You don't have to be a part of the world. You don't have to subscribe to what the world is trying to convince you is right and wrong. Our right and wrong comes from 
the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father through the Holy Spirit. It's called discernment. Our right and wrong, our moral compass is the Holy Bible, not the world. So when Jesus asks us to separate ourselves from the world, what he's really asking us to do is believe in him. Believe that his Father sent him. Believe that through his grace and mercy, we are saved. And through his act of the crucifixion and cross, on the cross, and the resurrection, we have that path to eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Do you even know how to separate yourself from the world? It's not that difficult. It's staying in your word. It's trusting in the Lord. It's putting your faith and your belief in God the Father and His Son Jesus. And through the Holy Spirit, allowing the Holy Spirit in Jesus to start changing your heart, start changing your mind, start changing the way you think, start changing the way you act. Start changing, and this is really important, how you react to things. You know, sometimes the way we act is different than the way we react. You know, it sounds silly, but it, it really is true. You know, if someone is coming against you or someone is, you know, uh, being mean to you or, you know, doing something that makes you very uncomfortable, your reaction is important on how you react. You react, react as Christ would ask us to, or do you react in a way that the world expects you to react? That's what I mean by the difference of acting versus reacting. Acting is, you know, your everyday demeanor. How do you act? How do you behave? You know, it's, it's, they're different. There are subtle differences, but there's differences. <clears throat> Do you believe God loves rituals more than he loves you? Do you believe that, you know, some teachings tell you you have to uh, do X, Y, and Z to get to the kingdom of heaven? Or do you believe that God loved you so much that he gave his son and all you need do is receive him? Accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand that he is the only way to the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and this is a really important question as you're answering these things when we go when we go through them. You know, where does God sit in your list of priorities? Where does spending time with God sit in your list of priorities? on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. Because the answer to that question will help you answer the questions above it. Will answer if you really truly believe Jesus is the Son of God. If you really do believe that Jesus is the new covenant. If you really do believe that God brought Jesus to develop a closer relationship to him. If you spend more time with God, you will realize these things. And these questions are easy to answer. <coughs> Excuse me. If you find that they're difficult to answer, then I would recommend that you, and pray that you spend more time uh, in, your, in your word with the Lord Jesus Christ, with his Father. And just meditate, meditate on these things as you uh, as you spend time during the day, during the week. Don't let too much time go between, you know, reading your Bible and, and speaking with God and allowing God to minister to you. You know, we're in a time in our society where it's going to become very, very good, difficult. You know, you're either con con going to conform to society as a Christian, or you're going to be outcast. And we can see that happening all across the world, the globe. And it is going, it's right at our doorsteps. 
So the more time we spend with God, the more we believe that God is going to protect us. The more we believe that this world, as we separate ourselves from the world, those things will not define who we are and will not dictate how we feel because our faith and our trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go through some background from last week or two weeks ago, actually. You know, the message that Jesus had to only die once for our sins is plain and simple. The author of Hebrews made a very strong case that Jesus only had to die once. And he will only ever die once. God does not require his son to continuously die for our sins. He did it. He did it once and once and for all for all of our sins. We need to die to our sins. We need to die to our sins once, once and for all. Do we continue to sin? Yes, because we live in a sinful world. We live in a sinful nature. But what helps us is when we repent, when we have the Holy Spirit in us, when we're filled and we have that discernment, that moral compass, and we know the difference between sinning and non-sinning, then we can repent. We can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us, to forgive us of our sins. And you know what? The Bible teaches us he will do it. And he doesn't have to think about it. And he doesn't have to pontificate and give you a timeline when you're going to be forgiven. The moment you ask the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you with a sincere heart and repent of your sins, that moment you are forgiven. And that's the beautiful thing about our relationship with Jesus Christ. That is precisely what God wanted when he brought the new covenant called Jesus and introduced him. He didn't want to have to go through the blood rituals, the animal sacrifices, because God knew that it was incomplete. The first covenant was incomplete. And the way God wanted to complete it is through his son. And he's done it. And we have evidence of it. We can read scripture all day long and always the scripture, the apostles will point to the Lord Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he has made for each and every one of us. Some may think that, you know what, you're chosen. Some may think that you're not chosen. Some may think that you have committed such heinous sins that you cannot be forgiven. But remember what Jesus said on the cross when the Roman soldiers who beat him from the place where he was scourged all the way to the hill of skulls. What did he do when they were laughing at the foot of the cross at him, wanting to divide his garments? What did he say? Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. And at that moment, they were forgiven. Because Jesus has a forgiving heart. Jesus had to forgive because God the Father requires us to forgive those who come against us. So we may be forgiven. So God can work in our lives and he can change our hearts. You know, an unforgiving heart becomes very hard. It becomes like what Jesus describes as that millstone around our necks with a hardened heart. And you know, when you go through these rituals and you don't understand that Jesus is the one who softened our hearts, who can soften our hearts, who will soften our hearts. Through these rituals, you know, the animal blood can't do it. It's not sufficient. The animal cannot do it. It's not sufficient. How can an animal heal a human heart? How can the blood of an animal heal a human heart? It's impossible. Why do we say that? Because our Lord 
Jesus Christ came as a new covenant. God the Father gave him to us. God knew those things could not happen. That's why Jesus is here. So this week we're going to talk about understanding that we cannot become perfect believers through the law. We just can't. The law cannot make us perfect in our beliefs. The law cannot bring us to that place where we are standing right next to God the Father and His Son in the kingdom of heaven, witnessing and singing hallelujah in heaven with them without the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to develop that strong relationship. I can't emphasize that. And, you know, through Hebrews, this is what the Hebrew author is making through the book of Hebrews. There are many, many sub-messages in the book of Hebrews. But think about this. The main message that keeps pouring into me is God brought his son. His son sits at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven to develop a stronger relationship with them in heaven so we may make it into heaven. And I'm not suggesting the time before Jesus came, you don't make it to heaven because that's not what the Bible teaches us. If you loved God pre-Jesus in the Old Testament, you certainly have a place in heaven. But what God tells us, what the Bible teaches us, is after he brings his son and the new covenant exists, he is the way, the truth, the life. Nobody comes to his father except through Jesus. So that's what the Bible teaches us. And that's what we have to remember. We have to understand those things. We have to be diligent in our thought. We have to be diligent in our belief. We have to stand firm with what Jesus teaches us. If not, we will be washed away when the next big wave of the world comes. And we will diminish and be melted into the world. Again, just, you know, we haven't talked about this in a while. The context, the Hebrew authors talking to the Jewish community, the Hebrew, the Hebrew, trying to convince in the first century that Jesus is the Messiah, where up until the ministry of Jesus, everybody believed that the Messiah has not come. And even to the point where Jesus walked through his ministry, Jesus went to the cross. Jesus died. Jesus resurrected. Jesus healed many, many people. The Pharisees, Sadducees, Sanhedrins still did not believe. The Hebrews still did not believe he was the Messiah. Because they felt that their Messiah, as written in the Talmud, would come and he would not suffer. He would be the king. He would reign as a king. He would born, be born into kingdom. This is why in the book of Matthew, when you read the genealogy, genealogy of Jesus, where Jesus started, because he is the king, and his genealogy is important. But that's what the Hebrew author was facing. He was facing the ridicule, the scorn. And you probably, you know, we're accustomed to hearing, you know, people, you know, who are angry in this world today, you know, the first thing they resort to is violence. The, the first thing they resort to is death threats. Can you imagine a Hebrew author trying to convince the Hebrews that Jesus is the Messiah? And he makes a very strong case in this book of Hebrews. And, and it's just wonderful. Anyway, so let's pick up in Scripture. Let's pick up in Hebrews 
uh, 10, 1 through 4. We'll read the scripture, and then we'll start unpacking it as we go. Uh, Hebrews 10, 1, For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, for worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sins. It goes on to say in verse 3, but in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. And I'm reading from the New King James Version if you're reading along so. You know, there may be a little bit of difference in words that are used, but context is all the same, no matter what version that you're reading. So anyways, let's jump into uh, uh, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never, with the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. The Greek word shadow, skia. A faint archetype which foreshadows a latter reality, foreshadowing, a faint prototype. And what the author is telling us is, remember, we learned that the tabernacle was a shadow of what is in heaven. The sacrifice of the blood of the animals is a shadow of Jesus in heaven and his sacrifice. So these are shadows in the image. The Greek word image is icon. Forms a contrast to, form of things in contrast to their sakia, replicates or a mirror-like image. So it's you looking in the mirror. That's who Jesus is. The shadow is exactly that. It is a shadow. When we stand in the sun and we see our shadow, we don't see the definition of ourselves. We see an outline. But we can't see our facial definition in a shadow. We can't see our body definition in a shadow. We see a shadow. You cannot read a book in a, a, a shadow of the book, the words on the pages. And that's what the Hebrew author is t talking to us about in our lives. You know, are we living in the shadow? Or are we living in the image of Christ? Are we living in the shadow of the image of Christ? You know, Christ asks us to live in his image, to grow into his image, to be like him. Icon, Greek, image, to be a mirror of him. Can we get there when we are in our final glory state? We will still not be like him, but we will be righteous enough to be into the kingdom of heaven. And this is where spiritual growth is important. We have to continuously grow in our spirit. We have to continuously grow with God. And we have to continuously be like his son. So we may be righteous. So we may be called into the kingdom of heaven because we are righteous. Remember, in the kingdom of heaven, there is no sin. So we can't bring the sins of the world into heaven. We can't bring the sins in our hearts into heaven. That is the purpose of repentance. That is the purpose of forgiveness. And that's why it is so important. Let's look at some scripture here. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus was born into humanity, the Holy Spirit, 
took him from glory to glory. The same expectation that God has for us when we receive him from glory to glory, being a mirror image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has it right. When we believe that, when we believe that Paul had it right, that we should become a mirror image of Christ, how much better would this world be? How much better would the environment that you have, your sphere of influence would be amongst those who want to come against you? If we all tried to be like Christ, I tell you, if this whole world turned into the image of Christ, we would call it the Garden of Eden. We would be in a euphoric state because there would be no more sin. There would be no more hatred. There would only be God's love, God's grace, God's mercy. God and his son. Let's look at another Verse 2. For then would they have not ceased to be offered, for the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. The author asks a great question here. If the blood of the sacrificed animal was good enough, we would have no more consciousness of sins. And what he's saying is that we wouldn't have to atone for the sins every year. We wouldn't have to atone for our sins every day. We ask for forgiveness, but we don't go through the sacrifice, the blood sacrifice. We don't go through the animal sacrifice. We don't go through the rituals. Our ritual is as simple as this. Let's break it down. Lord, forgive me for I've sinned against you today. Lord, take those things out of my heart. When you pray that and ask that and seek that with all sincerity of your heart, God delivers. And he delivers quickly. Let's look at some scripture here. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Let's say that again. If I regard iniquity in my heart, if I don't seek forgiveness, if I carry sin slash iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. I cannot pray with a sinful heart and expect the Lord to be obedient or to be um, responsive. We have to release the sin in our hearts. And when you do that, it may seem like if, if someone comes against you and you don't, and, and you go up to them and you seek forgiveness, but they don't reciprocate. That is not for you to concern yourself with. That is not for you to t tell yourself that the next time this happens, I'm not going to seek forgiveness because I've seen nothing happen when I did it the last time. It doesn't matter. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us every time that we come against somebody or someone comes against us, there has to be a method of forgiveness. And that method of forgiveness is us reaching out and seeking forgiveness even though we don't think we're in the wrong. Because that creates a heart that will not fester and harden. Remember here, 66, 18, if I regard inequity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. It's so important. John 13, 10, Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And what is Jesus telling Peter? He's addressing Peter in this. You know, that in we 
once we are cleansed, once we are cleansed with his blood, Jesus is using the analogy, we walk in our feet. In the first century, they walked in sandals. There was dirt everywhere. There wasn't concrete. There wasn't grass. There wasn't paved roads. So their feet got dirty. So Jesus is saying, once you are cleansed, you need to wash your feet. Once we are cleansed, we are cleansed. Our body is cleansed, but our heart may accept or still try to be convinced of the ways of the world. And our hearts may, you know, fester with some sin. So, yes, we continuously need to seek forgiveness of those sins that we commit. Because that's what God asks us to do, to forgive and be forgiven. Those things are important. Those things are what we need to do. And that's what he's trying to teach here to Peter and the rest of the apostles. Let's look at Acts 59. And made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And who is being talked to? Us and them. The Jews versus the Gentiles. There is no distinction. Our hearts need to be purified by faith. And it doesn't matter what denomination you are. It doesn't matter what part of the world you come from. Your heart needs to be purified by the faith that God pours into us. And this is the message. And this is the message that the Hebrew author is telling us that only Jesus, through his blood, can we achieve that. We can't do that any longer. There's nothing in this world that can get us closer to the relationship with God. Now that the new covenant has been upon us for over 2,000 years called Jesus Christ, except for the decision that we make to follow him to live our lives with him, to allow him to change our hearts. That's the only thing that is preventing us from getting to the kingdom of heaven is our own decisions, our own desires. If you desire to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you desire to live with him and give your whole life to him, guess what? God will Lay out the plan and the path for you to get there. If you half-heartedly desire, God will still lay out a plan, but it's your choice to get on that path and continue to walk. And don't look right, don't look left. Look straight at the light, standing at the end of the road, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, the light, the way, the truth, the life. That's what we should be focusing on. That's what we should be meditating on. Those are the words we need to embed in our minds and our hearts. Hebrews 10.3, uh, but in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. I just mentioned that. You know what? If you have to go and congregate into a single place outside of Jerusalem, inside of Jerusalem for the year of atonement every year. It's just a constant, constant reminder that we sin. Through the Holy Spirit today, the, He will remind us when we sin. He will give us that discernment. He has given us that discernment when we follow Christ, when we receive Him. The moment we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit lives in us. It doesn't take days, weeks, months, years. The moment we receive with a sincere heart the Lord Jesus Christ, he will live in us. And it's our choice on when we start to listen and when we start to react to what the Holy Spirit is telling us. That's the time delay. It's not the delay that God is waiting, you know, for, uh, you know, keeping us in some, some period of initiation period. 
when you pass these three or four tests, when you sacrifice these five or six things, then I'll have the Holy Spirit come and live in you. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us when we receive Christ, when we accept him, when we ask him to live in our hearts at that moment when we are sincere, the Holy Spirit is there and starts working in our lives. Let's look at some scripture, Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, will never remember our sins unless you let them fester in your heart, unless you are not repentant and unforgiving. But he will remember them no more. And he's going to be merciful to the unrighteous. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about us before our life with Christ, before the decision that we make to follow Christ. We're all unrighteous. We all have sinful hearts, the Bible says. Up until that point, God has mercy on us. He's long-suffering, remember. And through his son, through the new covenant, he now has grace, never-ending grace, waiting, waiting for us to truly live the life that he has given us. Let's look at Hebrews 8.13. In that, he says, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And we've studied this before. I uh, preached on this verse before. Let's remind ourselves that God is going to have mercy on the unrighteous. He will no longer remember our sins because he is telling us that the old covenant has gone away. You know, I have conversations all the time with people. I heard something very interesting the other day. Someone was sharing with me how frustrated they are in, in life and, you know, things aren't going well for them and, you know, with relationship, with work, things like that. And he was explaining to me a relationship issue. And he said, the part of Christ in me wants to have compassion and grace and mercy. And I thought to myself, and then I actually said this to him, I wish it was all of you because Christ cannot just be a part of your life. Christ has to be your full life. He has to live in you fully. Because I will guarantee you this, and I didn't say this to him, but I'll say it to you now. A part of us will not make it into heaven. The only part of Christ that we allow in us will not make it to heaven. It's all or nothing. You're either all in or you're all out. And that's the way God intended it. Why? Because God is righteous. Why? Because righteousness lives in heaven. Why? Because there is no longer sin in heaven. And my prayer is that we focus on those things and we let it bring us to that place in God's grace and God's mercy and God's building a new spirit in us. It's not just a part of us. It has to be all or nothing. And you know what? I know this is reality. When we receive Christ, we still want to cling on to the world and praise God that he's given us grace and he's given us mercy and he gives us time. And I know when people say things a part of me, I know that God's got them because if God's got a part of you, he's going to get all of you. You just don't know it yet. And that's how God works. Once he has a part of you, he's going to have all of you. 
And once you hear the truth, then God expects you to follow the truth and no longer follow the world. We are all on a different timeline with God. That's why the personal relationship with Christ is so important. That's why the rituals, the atonement once a year, you know, was complicated because God works in everybody's life at a different time, in a different way. His message is always constant. It's consistent. But the way we receive it, the way we, we react to it is different. And that's the grace of God pouring into us and protecting us. And that's how beautiful God and his son are. Because God knew it would take, you know, different people, different levels. Different levels in their walk. We've all heard it. But you know what? To use that, you know, I'm not ready to do this because I'm a new Christian is not, not an excuse. God will work in your life as quickly as you allow him to. The more you push and kick against the goad, the more you shove away, the longer it will take. But again, what do we know about our God and the Lord Jesus Christ? They are long-suffering and they will wait. And they have no problem putting events in your life that cause consternation, that get you to think that there is a better way to live than what you are doing in the world. There is a better way to live with the Lord Jesus Christ than what you are living in the world. You may not see it now, but once you are in the kingdom, you will see it and it will be very clear to you. And that's God's promise, to separate us from the world. That's how you see the separation. Let's look at verse 4. Verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. God never intended the blood sacrifices to remove our sins. He knew it was incomplete, the first covenant. He knew that you know, what we build on this in this world is just a shadow of what he has built in the kingdom of heaven, the tabernacle in heaven, his Lord Jesus Christ, his son in heaven. And I just misspoke. I said, God's his Lord Jesus Christ. No, his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So forgive me for that, please. It has to be clear to us that God only wants our hearts. He only wants us to move forward in the kingdom of heaven. When he calls us, he wants us to answer. When we reach out to him, he wants our hearts. He wants our sincerity. He wants us to receive him. Let's look at some scripture here, Micah 6, 6 and 7. With that, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? I mean, Micah, the prophet, is asking a very pointed question. And I'm not going to leave you in a cliffhanger here, because in verse 8, this question gets answered. But before we go there, just think about what is being asked. You know, should I give everything I have? The sacrifice, the sins that I commit. And here's what God says. He has shown you, O oh man, 
This is actually Micah, but this is God's perspective. What is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's read that again. He has shown you, O oh man, us. We are O oh men and women. What is good? God has shown us what is good. His son, Jesus Christ, is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly? What is to do justly? To do those things that are right in the eyes of God, in the eyes of his son. To love mercy. Why does he say here to love mercy? Because we need to show mercy to others. We need to have a softened heart. We need to be able to be merciful to others when they come against us. We need to love that. It needs to be in our nature. When we represent who Jesus Christ is and God the Father is, we need to have mercy. Do we need to be a doormat? No. God never expects us to be a doormat because when God has consequences, we also should practice consequences. Now, be very careful because what you dish out, you will receive. But mercy and love, those things, when you dish them out, you will receive them from our Lord and Savior. And when we walk humbly with God, He will be with us. Because we have then humbled ourselves. We have then separated ourselves from the world. And we need not look back when we are humble in the eyes of the Lord. When we have a humble heart. When we have a humble disposition. And that's what God and Jesus expect from us. And that's what we should expect from us when we commit to the Lord Jesus Christ. We should expect that we should have mercy. You know, sometimes it's hard. Let's not kid ourselves. It's hard. But you know what? If you meditate on God, he will teach you how to have mercy. Even if you didn't display it in the time that it was needed. You can always go back and make your wrongs right. And again, if you do that and it's not received very well, you've done what God asked you to do. You've humbly walked with him. Let's look at Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. My son, give me your heart. That's what God's asking. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, that's all we can give him. There's nothing else in this world. There's no amount of material wealth or any other wealth we can accumulate and give it to God and say that's enough. Because God doesn't want those things from us. What God wants is our heart. And he wants us what it says, and let your eyes observe my ways. Stay focused on him. Stay focused on who God is. A merciful God, a grace-filled God. A God full of grace, let me state it that way. A long-suffering God, a loving God. When we walk in his ways, when we give our hearts to him, he will reshape our heart. He will allow us to see things in a different way, the way he sees them in the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at a few encouraging verses here. 
to close out Psalm 5110. And I just love this, uh, these Psalms. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We, if we get up and we pray this every day, what kind of a day do you think you're going to have? Even if it was a most terrible day, you could imagine. If you wake up and say, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Steadfast, stay strong. Stay focused on the word of God. Clean my heart. Look at uh, 51, 16, and 17. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it to you. You do not delight in burnt offering. And this is important. God, give me a clean heart. Keep me steadfast. I do not have to sacrifice anything because you do not de desire it. You do not delight in burnt offering. I do not have to give you a burnt offering. I have to ask you to give me a clean heart. Renew my spirit. Give me a steadfast spirit. The sacrifices in verse 17 of God are bro a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Meditate on that. The sacrifices that we are going to give to God that God wants from us are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. So he can come in and he can heal your heart. He can heal your mind. He can heal you. He can separate you from the world. He can give you a new mind. He can give you a new spirit. He can give you a new heart. That's the sacrifice. That's the present that God gave us through the new covenant. The sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ gave us this. We no longer have to do burnt offerings. We no longer have to do blood sacrifices. We only come to God with a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. And as God is healing us, we go to God with a joyful spirit, with a joyful heart. We start to become like Jesus in the image of Christ. That's who we become. And that is God's plan. That is God's blueprint for our lives. And it's important that we remember that and we meditate on it. And when we forget it, go back. And etch this in your mind. Sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God doesn't expect to us to come to him in perfect standing because God knows us. God knows we are not perfect. God knows we are far from perfect. What God wants is a broken heart, a broken spirit. And us crying out, fix me, Lord. You are the only one that can fix me. It's not this world. It's not anything in this world that will fix us. And prepare us from glory to glory to get into heaven. Except for the Lord Jesus Christ. In conclusion, let's wrap up here. You know, when Jesus was on a cross and said the words, it is finished. Let's look at John 19.30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He, in fact, was telling the world that his kingdom would now begin in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus would fulfill God's promise of a new covenant and the prophecy, the prophet Isaiah, would be complete. God did this because he no longer wanted to be separated by a curtain. He no longer wanted the sanctuary separated from the Holy of Holies. His son tore that curtain. The Bible teaches us top to bottom. He no longer wanted that. He wanted more direct relationship. He wanted more precise 
conversation with us. He did not want the filter of five men, 10 men, one man. He wanted our conversation one-on-one. It's not a conference call with God. It is a point-to-point call. You dial up God, he answers. You don't have to conference anybody else in. You don't have to get the approval from anybody to talk to God. He wanted more. He expects more. We should give him more. It is through the relationship with his son that God has achieved this. Our relationship with God and his son is a critical element in living in the kingdom of heaven for eternity. To have a resting place surrounded by the love and peace of God and Jesus in heaven is hard to imagine, but we will be there. But that journey starts today. It starts in your life now. It could have started 20 years ago when you received Christ, Christ, but it starts. It starts, and God must work and give us a contrite heart. He must give us a means to be forgiven our sins, and he did in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. When we allow the Holy Spirit to live in us, When we receive Christ and we believe with all our hearts and minds that he died for us, that he is the only way into the kingdom of heaven, we will truly find that place in heaven. And as we meditate on that daily, let's be reminded of the things that God has given us and the many more things that God has prepared to give us if we're obedient to him, if we follow him, if we love him, if we love others, if we follow his commandments, if we don't idle the things of the world, but put all our faith and trust and hope in him and his son, he will give us a better life. He will give us a life for eternity. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, bring to my heart those things you want me to change. Lord, bring to my mind those things you want me to remember. Lord, bring to my lips those things you want me to speak of for the rest of my days. And I just thank you, Father. I give you all praise. I give you all glory for working mightily in us that you may work mightily through us. Father, without you, we are empty. We are broken. Lord, with you, we have become whole. And our life has meaning. Because you love us so much that you've given your son, that you provided that meaning. And that meaning is to live with you for eternity into the kingdom of heaven. And we know, Father, it is a lifelong journey. And our prayer is that you are long-suffering. And and our thanks is that you are long-suffering. And you're full of mercy. And you're full of grace, Father. And we know one day we will see you face-to-face with your Son sitting on the throne in the kingdom of heaven with your Son sitting at your right hand. And we will be there glorifying you, Father God in heaven, singing praises of who you are and being in a peaceful environment filled with love. Lord God in heaven, we look so forward to those days. So we just thank you, Jesus. We praise your holy name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all say amen. I want to thank you all. 
for joining us today. I hope you have a blessed day. And may the Lord just reach into you and start changing your life. Start changing the way you think. Start changing the way you process information. Because through God's power, that change will happen. Through your obedience, that change will happen quicker than you can imagine. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we all say, Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. God bless you all.